it's such a pleasure to be speaking with you this morning. I am Caitlin Bentley, and um, as just mentioned, I'm here with Sarah and Jasenka. We're from the University of Sheffield in the, U in the UK. We're mostly from the information school here, but I think amongst us, we uh, may have lived in about 23 different countries and studied eight different disciplines. Um, we all sort of coincidentally met each other working in the area of ICT for development, which um, that area is primarily concerned with ensuring that technology has a positive impact on people, communities and societies, um, and especially the poorest and the most marginalized. Today, uh, we're discussing how our research on intersectional approaches to data applies to building trustworthy digital identity systems. And I'll pass you off to Chisenga to start us off. Thank you, Caitlin. So we're all here because of this. Identity is a complicated thing and digitizing it is even harder. There's been some great work done in the ICT for D community, for example, by the team at Caribou Digital, showing how we might need to recognize and better understand some of this complexity when we are designing digital identification systems. So Vita Beda, along with other academics like Silvia Maciero, have shown how, especially for women and other marginalized people, that digitizing identity can have both positive and negative consequences at the same time. And it's crit critically important to understand why from a social technical and for us from a critical perspective too. In our research, we view identity from an intersectional perspective. This is an area of research and practice that has grown from black feminist thought and influence. It's commonly known as an analytical framework to explain how a person's identity is shaped by multiple aspects of their identity, such as their age, gender, gender ethnicity, and how all of this comes together in a time and place to increase the privilege or discrimination or advantage or disadvantage that they experience. But intersectionality is more than that. We adopt Patricia Hill Collins' view that intersectionality is a theory and a praxis. And we must acknowledge how systems and structures Oh, sorry. Okay. We must acknowledge how the systems and structures that people and communities are embedded within are also vital to understand and to try and change them. So we think this perspective is extremely valuable to adopt in the context of digital identification systems. Currently in Afghanistan, as I'm sure you're all aware, the capture of the US military and Afghan government biometric devices and records of between eight and 25 million vulnerable Afghani is now something that's quite life-threatening. And I'm sure this is going to be a hot topic today. It's not enough to design an effective identification system without considering the risk holistically for the most marginalized in a context as well as over time. But we also recognize the motivation behind the SDG goal 16.9 and as well as World Bank's identi identity for development initiative. Um, and all the research surrounding that it shows that that there could be important benefits to having a legal identity. According to the World Bank's research, there are massive disparities between and within countries. For example, up to 44% of women uh, and 28% of men in low-income countries do not have legal identity, compared to 2% of women and men in high-income countries. There is severe inequality here, and it needs to be resolved in a trustworthy manner. So we're, what we're interested in investigating is whether and how an intersectional approach could be useful for contemplating the design, development, and maintenance of digital identity systems in a way that accounts for the balancing act that occurs when weighing the risks and benefits, thus trustworthiness of a digital identity system. Uh, I'll pass back to Caitlin now. Um, so we adopt three frames to investigate that question. The first is intersectionality, as Jasenga has just discussed, what we mean by that. Um, but when we consider how this perspective might contribute, contribute to building trustworthy ID systems, we think that what's really important here is the, uh, that the institutions building, managing, and maintain, maintaining these systems are trustworthy. So what we consider as institutional trust is first the ways in which a person or an institution serves the interests of the truster. And in our case, we're particularly interest, interested in the perspectives of the most marginalized in society. And second is competence in the domain over which trust is being given. 
So we argue that it's relevant to examine the ways that institutions are competent in collecting, managing, storing, and disposing of data in the context of digital ID systems as a way of looking at institutional trustworthiness. We're inspired by Matthew Smith's paper, which explores how e-government systems can embed trustworthiness cues, which can help to build institutional trust in certain circumstances. And what he means by a trustworthiness cue is a, it's just a sign that demonstrates trust, trustworthiness properties. So in our case, trustworthy, trustworthiness properties could be things like formal accountability mechanisms, reliability, uh, of data monitoring by systems and access and etc. And so for us, uh, we're particularly interested in all of these things in relation to data. Um, but a main challenge, though, is that defining uh, data competencies from an intersectional perspective is still not clear cut. In the past few years, more than 2000 articles have been published, all claiming to adopt an intersectional approach. These articles uh, come from across the social sciences, medicine, humanities, psychology, the arts and literature. Um, and at the moment, uh, intersectional approaches are being applied in very diverse ways with limited methodological discussion and even less about data in particular. So on the one hand, we'd like to learn from this very diverse scope of literature but on the other hand, uh, we're, we're still drawing on our experience, like Sarah's expertise in migration, and Senga and I both collaborated, collaborated recently with the Inclusive Data Charter on the project uh, on this topic. So to give an idea uh, of what we mean by an intersectional approach to data, the Inclusive Data Charter's primer gives some key recommendations when adopting an intersectional approach. Um, and these are that institutions need to center the voices of uh, individuals at greatest risk of marginalization or discrimination. They need to promote equity across the entire data value chain. And this is really where we see uh, how everything from identifying a citizen group, collecting data from or about them, all the way to how this data is used and impacts on their lives is considered. And then finally, uh, it involves ensuring that data systems are inclusive and safe fundamentally. So um, just briefly, um, for our research on trustworthy digital ID systems, this is part of a wider research project to establish intersectional approaches to data. Um, as I just mentioned, um, we're doing a critical literature review of the 2,143 articles that adopt intersectional approaches. Um, we obviously can't review them all, so we're taking a random selection of 200 articles and coding them for how they handle data and what for. For this project, uh, we're doing a focused analysis to examine the migrant perspective uh, and articles focused on people and communities in developing countries specifically. Um, we're analyzing what data competencies are needed for digital identity systems to generate basically some recommendations for design or practice. And I'll pass over to Sarah now. So um, as our analysis is still not complete, uh, this is just a sneak peek of some very preliminary results relative to how the literature is using intersectional approaches to data and how it has been considering migration and the perspective of migrants. Uh, first of all, we saw that there is a good number of articles that include discussion of migration and intersectionality. Uh, so we found about 800 out of you know, our whole corpus, so it's about a 27 percent of the whole corpus, uh, but uh, the included literature does not specifically engage with digital identity um, as of yet. And this including migration, uh, we find it's a strength um, and it, it does result in unique ways of conceptualizing problems and understanding perspectives that are usually ignored by wider systems. Um, it helps determining impacts, for instance, using distinct, distinct modeling techniques. Uh, however, um, 
we know from experience that migration can include people in different situations, people at different stages of migration um, with different levels of vulnerability, uh, dealing with different contexts and different legal frameworks that may be connected also to different risks that they face. Um, and this is not always clarified or taken into consideration in the literature. Um, and in the same way, we haven't uh, yet at least found uh, studies that deal with the most vulnerable cases where dealing with data can also be even life threatening to migrants. So um, how would uh, intersectional data practices and competences look like and how could they be embedded in digital identity systems as trustworthy skills? Um, we suggest that they would take into consideration uh, these kind of questions that we have here, and specifically, they would include situational awareness, so identifying the context, including the different legal frameworks and how they can have an impact on migrants, uh, but also who is potentially discriminated against and what kind of context can pose risks and even dangers to migrants. And right now, um, including this kind of issues still relies a lot on experience and the experience of people that know the context and these are not easily captured in the data itself. So how can we use data to identify this context? And one suggestions would be um, definitely that according to our experience and according to the literature as well, ethnographic and qualitative research is extremely relevant to identify these kind of issues and to understand the effects of systems, especially on the most vulnerable. Um, and similarly, uh, prioritizing the engagement of people with the kind of lived experience that talk to this kind of marginalization uh, into these approaches and practices to data um, would be key. Um, as well as engaging them in the choice of institutions that should be involved in the collecting and storing and using migrants' identity data. And other suggestions have to do with making sure that migrants are truly informed relative to data chains uh, so that they can have some forms of control and decision on what happens to their data. And in this respect, probably thinking about decentralizing data to facilitate matters related to identity sharing and, and control on where and why to sharing data would be important. And finally, in the cases of migrants that are more at risk, uh, where collecting identity data can pose dangers to them and where there are reasons to question certain data practices, um, again, we can think about cases of biometrics. Um, so questioning whether a known collection of this data would be possible in certain cases, what it would imply, and understanding whether other kinds of data would be more suitable for migrants, again, in particularly vulnerable situations, and checking whether the benefits that they get out of it are uh, equivalent to the ones that uh, non-migrant communities would get out of it and whether the potential invasion of privacy um, would be commensurate to the gain uh, would be important. So um, as we have seen, different groups of people experiencing different kinds of marginalization or different levels of oppression would have definitely different needs and gain different benefits. Um, so in intersectional approaches enable digital identity systems to be adapted and remodeled in a tailored way, way for these kind of communities. Um, a key strength of an intersectional approach to data is that it considers data across the entire value, data value chain. So for digital ID systems, this implies starting before its design. Uh, through its development and implementation and all the way to its use, maintenance and reuse uh, change impact. So for us, this necessarily includes end of life planning. And given that we are not uh, yet finished with our analysis, we'd like to share with you just some er early ideas of what we envision um, our contribution might be. So for this, uh, let me go back to Matthew Smith's work on trustworthiness cues again. Um, in his research uh, of Chilean government services, he found that interactions um, with the systems that directly impacted on citizens seem to be the most important uh, thing for building institutional trust. 
So information that was not relevant to achieving a goal was not noticed and played an indirect role in determining people's perception um, in these cases. This insight helped us focus on what aspect of intersectional approaches to data may be the most relevant in the trust dynamic. And I'll share two key examples. First um, is effective requirements analysis in the design of digital identity systems. Often a detailed understanding of community needs already exists within communities and amongst local organizations or specialist researchers, but we continue to fail to connect the dots between it. And in other cases, resources of this type uh, of this type of work need to be unlocked so that it can happen consistently and across different types of communities. And secondly, is that it makes it explicit how participation is enacted in data governance. So centering the voices of the most marginalized can be interpreted in many ways where the development and implementation of digital identity systems is concerned. So enabling higher levels of participation in data governments, we presume will help to make system more directly applicable. However, it seems that just being explicit about the approach to data governance taken with some consultation should be a starting point. Um, we also think that allowing people to make their own choices about which institutions have access to their identity data should be a choice and that obligation and restrictions around granting access to this data are understood and connected to a goal that is relevant to, to them. Intersectional approaches seem to provide a framework to do this. So we are out of time now, uh, so we'll stop here, uh, but we're looking forward to hearing from you and whether there's uh, any particular avenues of investigation that would be uh, most useful to focus on for this research. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, and I've got to say, that was brilliant for a seamless um, three-way. I, I must confess, when we're, when we're organizing conferences and we see three speakers slide up, I think, oh my goodness, but you did it far uh, more adroitly than I could certainly do. So so well done. That, that was um, really well coordinated and, and a fascinating insight. So um, I, I have a couple of questions, if I may. Um, the, the first thing I'd, I'd like to touch on is, is the last point that sort of was made there about which institutions should access information. And, and this came up also in the Lovelace saying, you know, how do we share information? It's very interesting. But I wonder how much of a um, cognitive load that places on individuals. We've seen this kind of thing uh, before in the Royal Society report on privacy enhancing technologies, for example, and, and some of the work that Tim Berners-Lee is doing at the moment around solid, it's much more about decentralized, as you mentioned as well, giving people control of information, not, not just identity, but information. But I do think that sometimes when, when you have that, that does give a real significant management problem to individuals. So, so I'd like to, to, to ask, if, if we're going to give all of this control, have you looked at how people might be able to cope with, with managing that? So I don't know which of you to ask that to, but maybe, maybe you can um, consider it between you. Um, yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, I, I think I'm really... I'm really interested to keep learning and understanding more about the the technical solutions that are being proposed to decentralize information and to offload some of that control to citizens. I think uh, what our what our research is really focused on, however, is more about um, how an intersectional approach could be adopted in a development of these system, like in the implementation of these systems. And we also have to remember that our, our focus in this research is really on developing contexts where a lot of these systems don't exist. A lot of these countries um, that we're thinking about here um, lack the foundational data systems around health, around uh, statistics, around um, all these sorts of things. Um, so there is a lack of 
data capacity in general um, that we're thinking about. So maybe a lot of the new technical solutions um, is sort of uh, not going to be happening in the immediate term. Um, and they do, there, there are already communities um, as well as civil society organizations that are working in these areas um, that are handling enormous amounts of data. Um, and they do need better support to, um, to give a voice to institutions that also may not have the necessary competency, competencies to handle this information. Um, so I do think there is scope here for communities to come together. I think intersectionality uh, is not rigid in the way it defines a community. So you can be a member of multiple different types of communities at once, which which creates a lot of different challenges, like what you're just mentioning, like uh, it's not going to be um, one person controlling or managing their information in one way. Um, it is going to be complicated. Um, and that's why I think our research is really relevant and interesting because it's dealing in a very messy space at the moment. Um, but we're saying, look, uh, we're, we're going to take that as a challenge. We're going to see what is uh, a way that resonates with, um, with people and communities in ways that makes the most sense to them. So um, the World Bank's research found that one of the major reasons why people aren't getting legal identities is because they just don't have a need for it. So uh, again, if we're focusing on trustworthiness here, then uh, we are trying to focus on, okay, so what are the ways that we can find uh, that would make the, these systems most relevant to these people? And we're saying that across the data value chain, intersectional approaches can help you to both understand the needs of some of these people, it can help you to involve people in, um, in making it a priority that they have a say in how their information is governed, but it also enables institution reminds them that they also have to to build an evidence base around well is this system actually benefiting these people and we're not assuming that that is a given um and i i do wonder if chisanga might reflect a bit on this um in her in her experience in zambia because she's dealing with a lot of these challenges more specifically there yeah so maybe just to add to what you've already said just that it's so important for us to consider the data ecosystem. So Caitlin, you talked about uh, thinking about the context. So it's not just about the system itself, but when we're thinking about the design, the implementation, all these things, we need to think about the broader ecosystem. Like for example, um, my PhD research is on feminist data approaches and part of it is uh, working with statistical agencies and the production of gender statistics and, and also how we can use uh, digital sources. and even as we're considering things like where do we find aspects about women's lives in health data, where do we find aspects about women's lives in um, in registration systems, etc. And even as we're thinking about identity systems and all of these things, there's first the question of um, what is the context within which we're operating, to what extent is there political will, to what extent um, is there emphasis on uh, data and the data collection and data management systems being something of importance and to what extent is there the capacity that's required to what extent is there the regulatory framework so there are all these things that need to be considered when we're thinking about this context and especially so when we're talking about intersectional data thank you thank you so um yeah, it's really interesting this intersectional uh, approach, and I, I, I confess that um, I, I, I'm no expert on it at, at all. Um, but, but the way I see is um, this approach can be applied to, to many elements and, and applications of, of uh, identity systems. W will you pr be producing a sort of roadmap of here are the things that that, that really um, the the approach is, is is best suited for and it's a really timely and important thing it's almost a, a sort of roadmap because the way i see it is it's an approach and you're trying to to solve something but you're trying to address some key issues now 
we, we could say that in, intersectional approaches could work for, for all, of, of course, but there's somewhere it's particularly challenging if you don't, right? And I just wonder, do, do you plan on releasing that kind of roadmap? Or here are the most critical things that we need to look at to develop trustworthy digital ID in some specific application or context. Yes, I think I think you're right. Um, uh, we don't presume that it would it will work for everything or in in all circumstances. Um, but we we do think that it's valuable um, in general uh, to a certain degree. And I think our contribution again is really focusing on those interactions where people will have direct um, direct. Uh, what's the word, direct interactions with digital ID systems, but also how these systems are impacting on their lives and uh, their uh, their outcomes, their personal outcomes, as like getting a job or accessing health or, or things like that. Um, and we would try and break it down um, by focusing on these specific communities just to compare and contrast how, um, applying an intersectional approach to uh, the case of migrant communities versus um, a low-income country that lacks maybe uh, data infrastructure, for example, how would those approaches differ and what would the steps that you would need to take to make um, a digital ID system trustworthy, how would they be similar or different? Um, and maybe we can consider um, a decision-making framework or a set of guidelines that would be useful to consider, but I, I'm not sure that uh, a roadmap in a general sense would be um, applicable <laughs> to, all, to every country everywhere, but it, it, it's something we're, we're definitely curious to hear from the audience as well, like what format these recommendations could be useful to them and what would help them in um, in, in people who are designing and developing these systems and trying to understand their impact, um, like what would be helpful. Thank you so much, uh, Caitlin. And it was uh, interesting there how you said about engaging with this community and, and, and we hope we've given you an opportunity uh, for that. So there are some comments uh, in the chat. As I said, we're also uh, looking at social media and, and the three of you have also managed to uh, put your email address there. I, I think it's fan fascinating work. I'd certainly be keen uh, to learn a little bit more and have some conversations uh, outside of this. So really fantastic. So thank you very much uh, for joining us this, this morning. Let's hope that this just starts uh, a conversation.